I was definitely inspired for this particular message uh, from what we just walked through yesterday. I, I gave, I, you know, I put this message together before the wedding yesterday of uh, Nate Mockler and uh, Sarah Guthrie, who is now Sarah Mockler uh, officially. Uh, and we just, as a church body, reviewed that wedding and uh, I think it was just we were all awestruck with the beauty of our Lord expressed in and through that, and that was very, very precious. And so the title, uh, The Art of Waiting, uh, could indicate that I'm talking about waiting for marriage, and it could be applied that way because that's one application of this element of waiting. But when you get married, that doesn't mean you stop waiting in your life. Waiting is an is an exercise of the soul that is very present in a growing Christian life. And usually there's something in your life at every juncture, we say pause, all right? There's something in your life that you are being exercised in in this arena. The human side of us doesn't like waiting. This idea of waiting, passage of time where You have unknowns, and you don't have definition, you don't have clarity, and you don't have the punctuation on the end of a sentence. Uh, It's like someone's playing a song, and they have that one chord that's unresolved, and then you're like, ah, you know, one more, one more chord. And there's a dimension of us as humans that really struggles with this, but that struggle, if leveraged by the Spirit of God, actually grows us strong. There is a great blessing and a benefit that comes out of waiting when we allow the Spirit of God to take those seasons and utilize them. When you grumble, it like eliminates the beauty. It eliminates the power of God from the waiting. And so the enemy wants to stir you towards self-pity. He wants to stir you towards the grumble and towards frustration, which is like emptying out. It's like this, uh, let's say it, like his tank is filling up with blessings you know, as you're waiting. Of course, you can't see it, but it's filling up. And the moment you start to grumble, it's like opening up some cap on the bottom. It drains out. It's like, oh, you fell for the old classic bait of the enemy to grumble and complain? Don't do that. You see, when you go through this process, it's increasing something in your life. But we can't always see that. And so that's why I'm calling it the art of waiting, because it's it's a skill that you need to, in a sense, learn. I was talking with Steve Altmaier uh, yesterday, and he asked me about this morning's message, and I said it was on waiting. Uh, And we were talking about the Hebrew word for it, uh, and the word is kava. Uh, But he was saying, I've heard that it's like wrapping something tightly, and it is. So I was looking at it afresh uh, this morning. It's an interesting word because it does mean what we would think it means too, to anticipate to hold on for something to come, uh, to not forsake your position, you know, and and to give up even though God has promised. It means all of that, but this idea of a strong cord wrapped around something is interesting because it's like even the the concept is the weaving of strong rope. So it's like where you have different strands that are being woven together, and so when you're waiting upon the Lord, it's like you're being woven into his purposes in an inextricable way, which means you can't get out. You are deciding to say, I am going with God no matter what, and even if he takes a year, I'll be here. Even if he takes 10 years, I'll still stand here. Even if it's 50, I'll still remain. It's a position of faith in knowing that God will do it, and so you are inextricably tying yourself to his agenda, and you are waiting upon the Lord. So that idea, I think, is tremendously beautiful, and so we'll just sort of unpack this as we go. Uh, Hopefully, this is going to be on the shorter side as far as messages. I don't know why I said hopefully. Why why would we hope for a short message? That's ridiculous. Uh, But one of the things that this triggered is, and I don't remember what it was, but watching Nate and Sarah prepare and just knowing the integrity of their relationship was really profound. And it just, it reminded me of what I'm going to call Eric's life lessons, okay? So I have, over the past years, at different times, I've gone through life lessons. And I had a podcast series that went through my life lessons. I don't remember how many there are. I think it was like 20. 
there are a lot more, right? But 20 that if you could pick, and this is a fascinating statement for any of us at any juncture in life. What are the key things that God has taught me that if I was going to pass along to my kids just a handful of really good nuggets, what would it be? Or if, if say, a group of men were standing in front of me and said, could you give me your best stuff? What would it be? And it was interesting. I don't know if that's, that's a hard thing to answer because there's a different answer if you were to say, what are the most important truths in someone's discipleship? And what are the key truths that have most shaped you? Now, it should be the same answer, right? But sometimes you just want to presume. It's like, okay, you mean when I have these foundational truths, which are the ones that had the most impact on me practically? Like there was a fireworks display that went off and I got a whole new vision for my life. It's sort of like when someone says, who's your favorite character in the Bible? You just want to say, okay, we're all assuming that it's Jesus, but you mean in addition to Jesus. And that's sort of the way these life lessons are. Uh, so I'm just going to give them to you real quick. They, in, in hearing them on the screen, it doesn't actually help you uh, know what they are, but at least will let you know uh, the endless frontier, the principle of no, the Mayflower screw, the puddle principle, hammer and chisel, the principle of manure, getting the Proverbs out on the table, the principle of gentleness, the principle of recalibration, the leap for joy, the lowest seat, but what would they say? Prince, the principle of always, wear the badge, sacred waiting, rules versus relationship, the treasure map, don't ever read your press clippings, it must be personalized, and piles of stones. See, you just learned a whole bunch right there. You're just like, I just, my life was changed uh, this morning. Okay, th that's Eric language. Okay, if you were to bring up any of those, it's like, oh, yo, that's a whole trigger for me. I could start talking about any of those. Now, you're going to notice I'm going to emphasize one, sacred waiting. And so that's sort of what I'm going to unpack today is this idea. This is a very big part of my life. It's not just a part of my pre-marriage relationship. If any of you have re ever read The Love Story of Eric and Leslie, it's really good. Uh, I mean, it's really good. Uh, of course, every, every one of us that has a love story written by God for us tends to be biased that it's really good, right? Because it's written for us, and God is very good at tailoring his purposes, his calling to our life. But waiting has not been just a part of my pre-marriage years. It is a part of every aspect of my life. So the principle of waiting. Uh, again, like I said in the beginning, this is not something that we gravitate towards. And sort of, we don't even really like always having someone, you know, a pastor bring up something like this either. Lest God bring us through an extra difficult season of waiting because Eric had to bring it up. It's like, if he hadn't said it, I bet I wouldn't have gone through it. So there's different types of waiting. A lot of us think of waiting in a very passive sense where it's like you're standing in front of the, the microwave and you're waiting for it to finish. And it's just a passage of time where you're trying not to grumble. You don't really have a job to do other than just to endure the passage of time. And that's an incorrect understanding of how waiting works biblically. You see, waiting is a very active thing. It's not a passive thing where something else is doing all this work and you're just sitting there staring. And, you know, it's this blankness where you're just like, oh, I can't wait, you know, for this finally to be finished. When in actuality, it's a very active engagement. And so one of the mental pictures I think that best enunciates this is a farmer. A farmer has to be excellent at waiting, especially in certain climate zones, okay? My, I had two granddads that were farmers out in Idaho. And in Idaho... Uh, you know, they have irrigation systems and certain like in the Midwest, they might have, you know, it's rain. You know, you actually have enough rain where you, you, can, you can actually, you wait on the rain. And if the rain doesn't come, it's a big deal. But the irrigation system is if it's a drought, you're still waiting for them to release water uh, for you. And then you have to wait for the crop to grow. There's nothing worse, you know, for a farmer to do than to try and dig up his potatoes to see if they're growing. It's just like carve into the soil. It's like, oh, I guess they were growing. Now it's like, what do I do with this? So you have to be patient even when you don't see something. And that waiting is part of what proves the farmer a good farmer. Because the farmer has a job to do, and that is to till the soil, to then plant the soil, to then weed the soil, to water the soil, to weed the soil, to water the soil, to weed the soil, water the soil, and wait, 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 wait. And if he follows the rules of farming, the way it's been prescribed by his dad and his dad and his dad before him, he will get a crop. You see, his waiting will be rewarded. A farmer knows that. Okay, now there are 
things that can happen like tornadoes, okay? But barring the extreme, that farmer, when he does his job and he waits properly, it does not mean the absence of work on his part. He has something that he brings to the table. And that's what many of us forget when we are waiting is that there is a job for us to be doing in the process. And we oftentimes don't know what that is. It's not a very tangible thing to us. My flight out of gate 43, United Airlines promised. This is a, another one that I think really helps enunciate it to me. You know, Because for me, it's metaphors and illustrations that really locks things in. But if I was flying on United Airlines out of gate 43, I would receive a promise from United Airlines. Now, we all know that during <clears throat> the last couple of years, airlines can promise, 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 and not deliver, right? And cancel the flight because they are short-staffed. Okay, so let's imagine that we go back two years <laughs> and we get back to the normal years of flight, right? But you receive a promise. Now, this isn't a promise from God. This is a promise from United Airlines. And ironically, you will fix your life around that promise, trusting that United Airlines is going to come through for you. Isn't that an interesting thought? Now, it's not even God talking to you, but you will do all sorts of work. You will actively engage in a waiting process, even though you can't see that plane. Because you have received a promise, you are going to go through great efforts to get to that airport, to that gate, with the confidence that when you do, United Airlines will have done their job. So let's walk through that. So I may wish to fly now. Okay, here I am in Windsor, Colorado, and I'm like, I just wish I could be there now. However, there's a process I have to walk through, and I'm going to call that process waiting. Now, even though the process is waiting, in other words, I don't have the destination immediately, and I may want it right now, there's something that I need to participate in to get there. So I may wish to fly now, but I must wait for the right time to fly. I must do all that is necessary in the meantime to ready myself for the flight. I must pack. I must hop in the car. I must drive to the airport. I must park my car. I must go through security. I must walk to the terminal. I must walk to the specified gate. How can I go through all these steps without seeing the plane? I just, it's, a, it's the question for every one of us as Christians. How can we go through all of this even though we have not seen Jesus coming in the clouds? It's like, do we actually make effort and do things even though we can't tangibly see something yet? Yes, because we trust the Word of God. If God has said He's going to do something, then we build our life in a waiting model around the anticipation for that. I've oftentimes said no one waits at a bus stop if they were not told that a bus was going to come. The reason they wait there is because of a bus schedule. Someone says, the bus will be here at such and such a time, and so then you go out in the rain and stand there. And you would look like an absolute fool if there was no bus actually planning to come there. However, you are willing to go through whatever it takes. I don't know how many of us are that interested in riding a bus, but to go and to anticipate and to know that that bus will come, and so you will engage in that. It's an active thing in your soul. We are receiving the Word of God, the promise of God, and we say, I trust that. And since I trust you, Lord, I am going to actively move in my side of the ledger towards that. And that is the idea of waiting. It is that weaving together of the rope. I am aligning myself as a rope strand in God's purposes. To wait in such a fashion, I must have confidence that when United Airlines declares that there will be a plane waiting at gate 43 in Concourse B to fly me to San Antonio, that they are telling me the truth. I am basing my waiting upon a credible promise from a credible source. The promised RV. So when I, and I don't know how old I was, I want to say eight, okay, but I could have been nine or ten, it's somewhere in that range. And I remember it vividly, but I don't remember my age. My kids always remember their age. It's like, and I was 11 and a half. It's like, how do, how do you remember that you were 11 and a half? And I just don't. So I'm in a range of like eight to 10. It was the first night I ever drank coffee. Uh, I remember that too. Uh, so, but my parents left on an adventure and they were going to get something special for the family. And I don't remember if I knew it was an RV, okay, but I may have. I don't, I don't quite remember those details. I just remember they were going to get something very special for the family. And so I know my parents are going to return. 
but they didn't give me an exact time, which is really hard. And have you ever noticed that that actually fits the kingdom of heaven really well? God says he's going to do it, but he doesn't give you an exact time of when it's going to happen. I'm coming soon. Define soon. (laughs) And soon is not defined. It has a lot of movement potentially to it. It could be one minute. It could be 2,000 years. And that's a unique thing to address in your soul when you know something's coming, but you don't have an exact time on it. And that, again, involves this idea of waiting, where we're anticipating the return of the bridegroom. If you're the servants, then you stand there and you wait, knowing he's going to return, so you have everything in order, and you are anticipating. This is the idea of waiting. And so my parents are going to come, and I sipped on some coffee that night, even though I may may not have been the right thing for me to do. I still feel a little guilt over it. But, you know, and it wasn't even that good, right? So even guilt with bad taste, ugh, that's a terrible combination. I still don't drink coffee uh, to this day. Uh, but I, I remember, and I call it fogging up the windows. I stared out that front window in our dining room down the street, and I could see the corner where my parents would come down. There's only one avenue down East Fremont Drive. And so I stared down that, and, you know, all night long, And it felt like it was, you know, literally multiple days, but it was probably just multiple hours. And I'll never forget the moment when the front of the RV turned the corner and my parents had an RV and they pulled in front of our house. And it was, I mean, literally one of the most exciting things. Now, my story sort of has a dark turn to it because the HOA wouldn't allow my parents to have the RV in the neighborhood, so they had to return it. But that's beside the point. Okay, guys, let's eliminate that from the story. It was so exciting to see that my anticipation and my waiting was rewarded with something I knew would happen. Why did I know it would happen? Because it's my parents. Of course, my parents aren't just going to stay away forever. And of course, my parents, if they said they're going to go and do something and get it for the family, they're going to come back, right? It's my parents. How much more so God the Father? If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. He's going to come through for you. He's not giving you his word and then saying, oh, did I say that? I don't remember saying that. He has promised and he cannot lie. He is going to come through for you. Isaiah 40, 31, my favorite scripture growing up. You know, when you're a kid, you get asked what your favorite scripture is, and this was mine. And I know for some of you, you're like, yeah, that was in my top list as well. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's a pretty strong response to waiting upon God. And so when we wait upon the Lord, when we get connected inextricably to him and say, I will not move from this position. I know you're going to come through for me. I am with you, Lord, no matter how long it takes. And by the way, when you say no matter how long it takes, usually what you mean is, you know, even if it's a week, you, you weren't thinking through that all the way, even if it's three years, even if it's 30 years. And if you read the Bible, there's a lot of passages of like 40 years. It's like, oh, no, no, God, don't, 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 don't read that. Don't read that. Isaiah 30, 18, blessed are all they that wait for him. You see, there is something about this non-grumbling non-complaining, non-self-pity version of life that rests in God and trusts him even through the passage of time, saying, God, I know you're going to do it. God, I know you're going to come through. God, I know you're going to turn this to good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. God, I know you. I know you're going to do this. And when you don't drain, you open that cap on the bottom and drain out all the blessing that is actually filling up and you're willing to walk through it all the way to the end, there is such a magnificent beauty that comes out when you allow God to do it his way in his time. Zephaniah 3.8, wait upon me, says the Lord. Psalm 25.5, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So it's not just a command to wait, but it's also be of good courage. May your soul be uplifted this morning just to freshly know 
that God is faithful and true. He will come through for you. If he says he'll be there at gate 43, he'll be there. He will not fail you. Our God is true to his word. Our waiting is not in vain. Psalm 37, 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. There's a lot of blessing and strength that comes with waiting. Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. Proverbs 20, 22, wait on the Lord and he shall save you. So I'm using the word sacred waiting. That's just a term Leslie and I have because there's waiting. You can wait. You don't need to be a Christian to wait, right? That, that's, that's something that exists. People have to wait all the time, wait in line, you know, and they might grumble a little, right? But you can wait even though you're not a believer. But sacred waiting is this idea of trusting that God knows how to choreograph our lives better than we do. Have you ever noticed that if you were to go on your timetable for things, if you've ever had the, the, the ability to look back and say, wow, God, your timing was perfect. Wow, if I had done it, I would have done this quickly, and I would have been in this mess. In other words, sometimes you're being led by God, and so, but then you anticipate the next step too quickly. You're like, oh, I see where you're going with this, and then you take the step instead of God leading you in that next step. It's like you fulfill uh, the end of the sentence. It's like, oh, I, I see where you're going with this. You know, it's like the river. It's just flowing in this direction. I'm going in this direction. When in actuality, God has brought you here, but he may have a turn, and it's an unexpected one, and he's going to get you where he's called you. I've oftentimes said, if he tells me to get to that doorway there, you know, that little entryway into the hall, you know, I can just say, oh, I see what you want now, and I just walk. However, when I say, okay, God, how do you want to get me to that doorway? It involves a sharp turn to the left you know, for a year, and then over here to the piano, and then, oh, oh, back over here to this door, you know, where the fire extinguisher is, and then maybe back to the back of the room. I'm like, God, I thought you were calling me here. He says, I am. I gave you insight into something I want to do in your life, but there are a few stops I have along the way to make you fit for what I'm calling you to do when you get to that doorway. And so to wait upon the Lord is to engage in his movement, even if it seems contrary at the time. I have a whole bunch of stories in my own life where I could say, wow, Lord, the timing of the Lord was perfect. And oh, I would have, I, I, my, what I had in my mind and what I was asking God for was actually a premature solution that God wanted to bring something about in such a more grand and full way. So sacred waiting is doing it his way. It's his set apart way of leading. Sacred things. These are things in our life that are extra special and have the holiness of God around them. They are other than the world's things. They are special in the kingdom of heaven, like a marriage, okay? A marriage is a sacred thing in life. A chair, it's not sacred, okay? A chair is just a chair. It's not bad. It's not like an evil thing, but it's, it's not a sacred thing, you know, but a marriage, oh, that's a sacred thing. A family, how about your children? This is a sacred part of your life. So it's it, those areas of your life where God has a special uh, highlighter pen that he has come out and says, this is where I need you to have extra special care. And these sacred things are very, very important. So in every area of life, there are sacred elements. Okay, so I have up on the screen in romance. In the area of romance, since we just had a wedding yesterday, that's fresh in all of our minds. And if you're single, it's probably extra fresh. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, when, as, as a guy, I didn't really think about my, what my wedding ceremony would look like. I, I feel bad about that. But I didn't, I don't know that I care. I just want to be married, right? Let's get past the marriage ceremony. Let's just get this thing going, okay? And, but for a girl, it's like every little detail. Uh, it's like what their dress looks like. I was talking to someone yesterday. It's like, so did you want to dress with a long train? And she said, no, no, it's going to be right to there. And then, you know, and she had elaborate description. It was actually pretty cool. I was like, wow, I never once thought about what my tux would look like. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's really neat because it's an anticipation. And a, bo a boy or a man approaches that maybe a little different with different priorities, different thoughts. And yet the blending together is very, very special. 
But in romance, I'm going to say a handhold, okay? Just taking someone's hand is a very sacred thing. You see, if I shook your hand today, it's not a sacred action. It's a pedestrian connection that has value. It's, it's still showing value and, and love and care, but it's, it's not a sacred touch. But there are touches that are very sacred, and they're set apart, and they're supposed to be reserved for special times. And so uh, when I, this is going to be an awkward story, but uh, join me in it. Uh, the first time I ever held a girl's hand. Oh, this is embarrassing. Okay. I was in uh, a movie theater, and I had this girl next to me that I was <clears throat> uh, interested in. And this is one of the most, this is embarrassing too, because I had my keys, and I didn't even drive it this time. So it shows you my age range. Uh, and and I had keys in my hand, probably to open the front door of the house. I'm not sure what they were in my hand for, but uh, they were in my hand, and her hand was just an inch from mine. And so with my pinky, I reached out, and then she reached out, and we were, I was holding pinkies. And then it was like two fingers, but the problem is I had a key that was uh, poking into my hand, and it was cutting off some sort of blood flow. And so pretty soon my hand went numb, my arm went numb, the side of my body was starting to tingle, and I refused to let go. I mean, that's how special it was. Now, it's interesting, when you prematurely engage in something sacred, it loses its beauty. It's like it empties, like the cap on the bottom of that tank, it empties it of its beauty. It's very fantastic when you first touch it, but if it's premature, it's like it doesn't have the protection of heaven. But when you savor it and you keep it for the sacred moments in agreement with God's choreography, like now, it not only is spectacular, but then the spectacular can last. And so a sacred handhold, a sacred kiss, a sacred touch, a sacred word, a sacred question, a sacred vow. Okay, now, if, if you understand the flow of romance, I just covered a lot of territory there. But when you rush these things, they lose their beauty. When you wait for them in agreement with God's timing, it like somehow maintains its togetherness. It's there and it can last. You see, God wants us to do it his way, not because he wants to penalize us, but because he wants to bless us. You see, with that waiting comes blessing. With that waiting comes greater strength. It's like the tank is filling up and it's hard. I remember... Uh, you see, I had thrown out kisses a little uh, more freely than I should have, okay? Now, I don't want to go too much into my background because it's not very <clears throat> fun to remember. But let's just say that uh, a kiss had lost its beauty. And that really bothered me. And so I came to God before I met Leslie, and I said, I, I, I just, I feel like I've really just messed up this area of my life. Lord, is there a way of you redeeming this? You know the answer to that? Yes. God loves to redeem, but we have to hand it to him. It's sort of like, God, okay, teach me how to wait. Oh, he did. And I remember when Leslie came into my life, my resolve was to do it differently. Didn't know what that looked like. But one of the things was, uh, it didn't, I didn't even know if I should hold her hand. I didn't know how this works. You know, what am I? And so I still remember, I used to always hug. I'm a very huggy guy, right? Until I had Leslie in my life, and then I didn't know what to do because I wanted to do this right. So I remember her getting off a plane. This is before 9-11 where you could actually go to the gate. No, I got off the plane and she was there with her family and I hugged all of her family members, but now I was in a relationship with her. So I was just stood there and bounced on my toes. And then she, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this story, but she, we were rock climbing and she was coming down off a rock and I didn't know if I should touch her hand. So I held out a stick. <laughs> she still remembers that. But here's what I can say. Even though I, I would probably encourage you differently than some of the decisions I made in regards to that, I feel like God blessed that. And God saw that I was like, God, I'm willing to wait for this, even though it's awkward. I wanted to wait for a kiss. And I tell you what, that was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life up to that point in time. I remember I had a dream where I kissed Leslie. And I woke up and I was like, <gasps> did that count? And then I sort of wanted to go back to sleep and keep that one going. But uh, the point is, it was a tension of soul that actually had a reward in the end. And I can speak personally about it. The reward was tremendous. 
but it was hard and it was a tension to wait for God's time and when he says green light now. It was so beautiful. That tank filled up with such blessing and beauty. And I was able to cherish that in my marriage still to this day. Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So that's showing us that there is a time for everything. God has a choreography. It's like, not now. Like, why not? Everyone else is enjoying it right now, but not you. I have a time. Everything has its season, but we need to be in agreement with God's seasons and his times. And that's hard because it goes against our humanity. In family. So I have a family. It's built from my marriage with Leslie, and I have six kids. But in this, there are things that are sacred, sacred steps forward. So I'm going to say a sacred introduction. If any of you have ever gone through this, you see, we're talking about Jesus all the time, but then there's that one time when you recognize your child is ready, and you have a very special input into them where you are depositing a very clear understanding of Jesus, not just you know, to a you know, church setting, but to an individual life and the way that they could understand it. And it's a very, very sacred moment. But there's all sorts of sacred introductions. There's information I have in my head as a dad that I don't just blurt out you know, when they're seven years old. But I restrain myself to speak it until I know that there's a readiness. The green light goes boom. And I know it's time to impart to my children a bit of knowledge, a bit of understanding that is beautiful, that is profound, that is wonderful. But when it is at the right time, there's an ignition inside of them too. When it's right, there's a blessing, a sacred training, a sacred word, a sacred question, a sacred handoff, a sacred sendoff. You know, there's all sorts of different dynamics in the development of children. And there's certain ones I haven't even reached yet. You know, a sacred handoff. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? It's a sacred handoff. You don't just do that when they're seven years old. In other words, there's a right time for these things when the light goes boom, and you know that it's time. In other words, we wait for these things. We do them in the right time. And when you rush that, you empty, you open that cap and drain out the blessing. When we walk in agreement with the Spirit of God, in stride with the Spirit of God, there is such a beauty, a wonder. In growing up, a sacred trust, a sacred piece of knowledge, a sacred responsibility, a sacred training, a sacred handoff, a sacred sendoff, a sacred transition. It's a different angle. It's the child perspective instead of the parent perspective. Very similar, but there, a child is waiting. There's certain things in our home, it's like, well, when you get to be this age, then you can start doing this. Have you ever noticed that those, it always seems like it's way too far away? Uh, and, you know, for, uh, we have this father-son gathering on Sunday nights, and it's, it's like, well, you have to be 12 years old. Well, that's a pain in the neck when you're nine. And you're like, are you serious? Three years? Yes, but it'll be worth it. And, of course, some of, you know, the kids are always like, yeah, by the time I get there, you're going to close down the father-son group. You can just sort of feel that, too. The good thing is God never closes down his operations, you know, even though parents sometimes do. But we have all sorts of little traditions where when you get to this age, you're able to participate in this. When you get to this, you get to go off on a special time with daddy or mommy, and we're going to do so. I, I had this one thing I was working on my computer, and Abby tried to look at it, and I closed it. And she was like, what was that? I go, well, you'll find out when you're 12. And she was like eight at the time. She's like, what? And when I'm 12? Now she's 12. Oh, you have to remind me about that, pumpkin. In church, you know, in church, we have the same thing. There's a choreography, a sacred meal. You see, it's supposed to be set apart. It's supposed to be different. We're supposed to commemorate something with it. It's a very, very special thing, a sacred commission. When you're laying hands on someone, you don't do it quickly. You do it when the green light goes off. And so actually there's something even in the church that is very similar, a sacred send-off, a sacred confrontation. If you've ever walked through church discipline, you don't want to do that haphazardly or too quickly either. You want it to be done in the green light agreement with God because it's, these are challenging things. A sacred blessing. Patiently awaiting the sacred moment. 
the words I love you. So the words I love you were something my mom said to me, Eric, never tell a girl you love her unless you plan on asking her to marry you in the next sentence. What? And I had that following me around all throughout my life. And so, because, you know, it's like if you're cool and you're in a relationship, those are powerful words. But I always had my mom, you know, saying that to me. I was like, oh, great, now I can't do this. And as a result, even when I was in a relationship with Leslie, it was, there were some awkward moments because I wasn't prepared to ask her to marry me in my next breath, thanks to my mom's quote. And so I remember I was signing this letter to her. I really, 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 all caps, like you. <laughs> Eric. And, but at the same time, Leslie knew that I was preserving those words. So when I spoke those words to her for the first time, my girl, Leslie, I love you. Will you marry me? You want to know how valuable those words were? Because they had been spared, awkwardly so, even for her, it's like, you've got to be kidding. You can say it, Eric. You know, I'll understand. It's like, I can't. I can't because unless I'm going to ask you to marry me in my next breath. Now, you don't have to live with my mom's quotes, you know, in, in your head. But for me, the value of reserving that until the green light made those words so precious, even to this day. The choreography of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting and a, and a beautiful thought to think that God is really good at choreography? That he's very good at moving things into place. And it's beautiful. The way that he choreographs is perfect. I could know that God desires to do something in my life, but often I must wait for the sacred timing for this something to arrive. The passage of time between the promise and the fulfillment is where the sacred waiting unfolds. When we wait, we discover that God is a masterful choreographer and he always supplies the perfect ending. I'm going on record right now of saying this is true. This has been proven true in my life so many times over. There are times when I want to grumble and I want to say, God, I think you are overlooking the fact that you need to finish the sentence that you started. You, you, you stopped short somewhere along the line. This is taking a little longer than it should. Or is it? It's never taking longer than it should. God is always right on time. I know that some of us, we joke as the church about God showing up at 11.59 and 59 seconds, which has happened many times in my life. And yet, I have to acknowledge it was the perfect timing. And even what he was working in me up until 11.59 and 59 seconds, before something, of course, was going to go kaboom at midnight. You know, there's, there's been a lot of kaboom moments that are right in front of me. It's like, oh, God, how's this going to work? And then he did it. Whoa, he did it. He always does it. And that's what we know as believers. Our waiting is not in vain. You wait upon the Lord, he will save you. You wait upon the Lord, you will be blessed. You wait upon the Lord, he will renew your strength. He will give you wings as eagles. You will have precisely what you need, but you have a job to do. You must engage in the waiting. Cherish the waiting. Don't grumble about it. Don't complain about it. Don't allow the frustration to creep in, but cherish it knowing that God is filling up that tank with blessing and beauty. And when that fulfillment arrives and he makes all things beautiful in his time, when that beauty is at its peak and the light turns green, you will never regret the waiting. Psalm 126. So when Annie Weshi created a video for us to remember the, the arrival home of Reese and Lilith, which was a three-year period of very excruciating waiting. Possibly, I don't want to say it's the hardest thing we've ever walked through because we've walked through a lot of hard things. I don't know if I can grade them all. They're, they're just hard as hard. But this was possibly one of the hardest things we ever walked through in our life was the challenges we faced with Haiti and the dynamics of getting these two kiddos home. And when they came home, wow. I still remember the moment when Leslie received, I think it was a text from Annie, it may have been a phone call, saying, we got the visas. And it seemed impossible. There were probably 10 different moments in the process where it seemed like, humanly speaking, it was impossible. Give up, Eric. Give up, Leslie. 
this will not work. And we refused to do that. We were integrally entwined with God's purposes. We know God's going to come through. We know it. And yet it was so painful and so hard. But the beauty in seeing the fulfillment was amazing. When the Lord brought back, well, the reason I said all that about Annie is she put this at the very end of the, the video. It might have been at the beginning. I think it was at the end. But it's very, very precious to us. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Father, I ask that this idea, this message, this, this concept of enduring the passage of time with the grace of God and triumphantly would shine in our souls afresh. That you would give us that fresh deposit of grace to walk through our current waiting season with triumph and strength instead of grumbling and complaining. Lord, strengthen us as the body of Christ. We love you and we trust you. It's in the precious name we pray.